Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about, uh, well, we've got the chief technology officers here, and we're talking about all things technology. And right now we're uh, just finishing up our lining up our, our strategic discussion. I want to throw it over to you, Cal, at Equinix. Once again, you, you've got a perspective there where you're seeing this activity going on across a lot of different agencies in the private sector as well. Uh, give us a, a glimpse of uh, what it's looking like and how what you're doing at Equinex is lining up to strategically what they're attempting to do as an agency. Yeah, hi, thanks, Lou. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, artificial intelligence, as uh, a lot of the other speakers have mentioned, is something that we are definitely seeing across uh, many agencies. And let me just uh, quickly illustrate what's happening in that space, which is uh, new and interesting. So historically, artificial intelligence has been there since 1950s. Uh, and in the first wave of artificial intelligence, uh, experts used to enter the rules into the system explicitly. And those systems were brittle because they couldn't handle a lot of conduct cases. Then the next generation of AI came where we have the era of big data and statistical techniques now had enough data to meaningfully you know, give predictions. Then uh, the advent of GPUs, which were used for graphical processing unit, now can be used to do actual crunching of the data. And, and, and so that really you know, uh, made, and the advent of clouds made AI mainstream. But now what's happening is that most organizations are realizing that they, on average, like 75% of enterprise applications are using around 10 external data sources. So they are realizing that all the data is not within their four walls. So they have to go and get data from outside. And there are many organizations that want to monetize their data also. And this is not just happening within, uh, between different companies, even within different departments in the same organization, data sharing is becoming extremely critical and they don't have good ways to do it because people don't want to part with their raw data. So that's the first thing, how to do data sharing. We are seeing a lot of demand for that. And the second thing we are seeing is that AI is becoming distributed. It's not just moving data, massive data sets into a cloud, building your AI model, and then inferencing that model there. What we are finding is that AI now, you build a model in one location, and then you move that model to a different location close to the edge for inference. And people have started to leverage cloud native technologies, uh, like you know distributed Kubernetes, uh, to actually orchestrate and federate the movement of AI models from one location to the other. And Equinix, we are heavily involved in both because our legacy is being the neutral location where the clouds and networks come to interact with each other. So now that's the same location people are actually putting what they call as AI marketplaces. Uh, so that's where you bring in your data and algorithm between different groups and you trade how to do that. Uh, so we are seeing the advent of AI marketplaces and we are also seeing the actual distributed core edge architectures getting deployed at Equinix, and they're leveraging our Equinix fabric to you know, connect, interconnect all these distributed locations. A very critical part of the ecosystem about stitching this together. Rob talked about this very thing about this, uh, you know, more advanced ways of sharing the data. Let me actually throw it over to you, Rob, and give us an example of a of a technology that you all did some forging on some 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 uh, examination, uh, testing, rolled it into production. And then, uh, you know, what, tell us about the results of that, right? What were the, uh, you know, I always like to hear the sort of, so what, all right? So we put this technology in, what happened once, once we did it? Yeah, absolutely, Luke. Um, I'll go uh, stick with the data theme and data products, really. Um, and I think that's, to me, is critical, at least from where we sit, is, is continuing to, focus on products and data is like anything else, it's just a product. Um, some of the technologies that we've been really partnering with, really the creators uh, for the past probably four or five years um, has been looking at Spark, looking at Delta, looking at uh, AutoML, looking at Redash. Um, these have provided a very good platform uh, an ecosystem for us to manage data, um, looking at you know CDC from all of our sources and streaming that data so that we can then make it actionable so we can then do data engineering, 
and then ultimately start to intelligently use and leverage algorithms to make better sense predictions, what have you, of that data. So we have, we've actually partnered with not only the creators of Kafka to do a lot of the streaming, we also partnered with the creators of Spark um, so that they get a better understanding of what we wanna do so we can understand the tech and then ultimately start to democratize it to not just technicians, but moving forward, actually leveraging it. So we talk about low code, no code and citizen development. My goal is to really do data as a service for individuals in the field so that they can simply become their own data scientists with this platform and ecosystem of data. So we've already started to realize that those benefits over the past two years going into the field, showcasing how folks can leverage this technology, um, training them on how to use this technology. And now we've got folks essentially being citizen development um, data product uh, producers um, in various facets of our organization, Either from just creating simple business insights to now all other areas and pockets of our organization doing essentially data science as a service for themselves and creating real products that have a value and meaning. Some of this has to do with entity resolution or network analytics. Some of it has to do with just NLP or text analytics. Um, so we, we've actually had quite a few of these things in production, leveraging this technology. And then again, I think it, what makes sense from an organization and uh, you know, as, well, as we move out and expand to, as I say, our other sister agencies, is we can start to build this catalog of digital products, not just the output, but also how we start to make these digital products, those algorithms that we can share and reuse, the actual ground truth data sets that can be, again, reused or um, emboldened so that we can make better sense of it. So we've actually, again, huge success in just working with, um, with our production folks in the service center operations, in our uh, field operations directorates, and then with risk and fraud and our CDO teams. Power to the folks on the ground there. It sounds awesome and um, super impressive as always. Gary, how about over at Hitachi? Uh, can you give us an example, one specific example there of uh, where you've seen this technology be implemented and the outcome from it? Well, I think uh, we're seeing some of these technologies being implemented in some of the what you environments that we're used to dealing with a lot of data, HPC environments that were you know, used to dealing with petabytes and petabytes of data that they were crunching through. And everyone is taking advantage of kind of that learning and that technology and that approach to that data set um, in the other agencies. Uh, so we have quite a few implementations in the labs where they're using you know, this, you know, a, a parallel file system, if you will, to enable high speed data access to run these models and, and leveraging things like GPU direct to keep, to keep the data close to that application processing. So I think it's leveraging those technologies. We see a lot of agencies leveraging, leveraging not only our technology, but other industry technologies in, in the market to, to fix these common data management and solutions or challenges. Yeah. Undoubtedly with all this sensor technology, IOT uh, capabilities that are out there collecting all this data, you're just getting football fields of this information that has to be processed. and. Uh, um, all this technology that's emerging to analyze it, uh, super important and very timely. Sanjay, how about over at SBA? I'm sure you've got an, a great example of uh, where you all were able to forge some technology, put it into, uh, into the, uh, the business line and solve some of those big problems you're having over there or we're having. Absolutely, let me give you uh, two quick ones and I believe uh, very quick ones and hopefully very resonating ones. So. SBA.gov is our primary portal to the outside world. Um, you know, a few years ago, we had actually migrated it uh, away from an on-premises world to a cloud environment. But more importantly, we'd gone sure. to a serviceless architecture and we'd also moved uh, to, you know, use of microservices. So back in April last year, the president tweeted SBA.gov and within the blink of an eye, uh, the number of concurrent users went up by over 150 times uh, within seconds. Given that this was already set up in an auto-scaling environment, um, the site just auto-scaled in near real time, uh, no blimps, uh, performed smoothly. Um, but the, the most important aspect of this is because 
this was a primary portal to the world, we could not afford this to be underperforming and certainly not being available at all. Another quick example let me talk about is very quickly is about uh, the cloud-based cybersecurity I'd mentioned earlier. So uh, back in, again, last uh, March, I was looking at, uh, we have full visibility into all of our incoming traffic, all of our assets and all of these things, regardless if people are remote or not. And we've had that for many years. So one of the things I was looking at was a portal of uh, incoming traffic into all of our portals. And I noticed that there was traffic coming from overseas, knowing that these programs were designed for the continental United States, uh, we implemented geofencing. Simply put, what it did was blocked any traffic which was not originating from the continental United States. And yes, some of the you know, um, uh, sharper folks might say, well, it's easy to spoof your traffic. Yes, it is, uh, no, no doubt about it. But uh, for the basic bad actor out there, perhaps it's a little too, one to a bigger hurdle to climb up and, and try and spoof that traffic. But so in terms of a mission impact, we basically block traffic which uh, could have you know, submitted applications or maybe had other bad intentions uh, clearly, the SBA has been in the crosshairs of all of the bad actors globally, and, and we just have to make sure that we are hopefully half a step ahead of them. And you're doing a fine job of that. Jonathan, how about, uh, can you give us uh, one quick example of where you've seen something coming out of the lab, so to speak, into production, and, and sort of what was the outcome of that? Sure. So, you know, um, I, I was talking about low code capabilities uh, before, and, you know, we, we've worked with a number of law enforcement agencies and, you know, we found that um, oftentimes, uh, you know, investigators have a lot of point solutions that they have to uh, deal with and it's difficult to. Or listen, like to deal with. Right. Uh, difficult to um, understand the complexity of, uh, of an investigation or how to move forward. So, you know, we used our low code capabilities um, with uh, w- one of these uh, inve- law enforcement agencies to, you know, create a tool to help them track cases uh, more seamlessly, um, create a unified view that allows um, agents and officers and leadership to see the status of the case. Uh, we gave investigators a lot of control to schedule their own um, appointments and track the status of their work. Uh, we did this in a mobile-friendly way. We, you know, we recognize you got to meet people where they are. Investigators in the field, they're, they they need to work off of different kinds of mobile devices. And um, you know, adding on top of that, uh, you know, connections back into the ServiceNow platform for asset management, for tracking evidence, for tracking other assets, and also dynamic scheduling capabilities, giving, um, uh, you know, giving them and uh, leadership the ability to assign and reassign cases based on um, proximity, uh, we found to be very important, along with reporting and analytics that are in our platform, but easily wired into a low-code application to ensure that everyone's got the right information, can make good management decisions and good on-the-ground decisions about how an investigation is proceeding and what are the next steps to to move that investigation forward. Super important uh, when when they're uh, in the the thick of it, uh, fighting the good fight, if you will. Uh, Brian Campo, uh, can you give an example of where you all had sort of cooked something up over there laid it down and then were able to unlock this capability across the uh, department. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'll, I'll kind of harken back to what Cal and Rob were talking about on the data side. I think um, you know, some of the things that we're trying to do at the department level to support data and to support the work that Rob's trying to do with you know, streaming data and, and getting more analytics and, and more insights out to the, uh, to, the, to the mission space is you know, at the department level, we're trying to figure out how do we fuse data? How do we bring data from USCIS, uh, CBP, FEMA, ICE? You know, how do we bring all of this data together, make it valuable, give all of our component agencies a chance to use it, um, let them figure out what they want to do with it, make it easy and available to them, but most of all, do it in a consistent manner. And that's what Cal was talking about, where you've got data that you know maybe each individual component doesn't own, but they need to figure out how to synthesize information from it. Um, so that's one of the things that we're trying to do at the uh, at the department level. Um, you know, with our recently stood up chief data officer, we're we're building out these data governance principles. We're mm-hmm. we're trying to figure out what our data catalogs look like across the department, and really trying to figure out how does data relate across these very disparate um, you know data sets, um, consistent data elements, understanding you know how all of our components are going to use it, and then most of all understanding sort of what the what the citizenry wants. How do we how do we support those citizen developers? How do we give them the data so that they can do things that we wouldn't even be thinking about? So, you know, at the department level, 
we're really trying to figure out how do we support our component uh, and citizenry to uh, to give them the data they need to uh, to be able to support us. Give them the data at the right time, at the right place. And the CDO, once again, another or entity where it's like, you know, well, what's that? All of a sudden, you know, hey, this is a really important uh, uh, position in every agency and hats off to Mike Horton for being uh, selected on that job over at DHS. All right, uh, Cal, how about, uh, we're talking about data right now. You gave a bunch of examples. Give us one example of where you've seen this being implemented, whatever uh, technology you wanna choose uh, sure. uh, to, to sort of uh, enable these agencies mission. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, currently um, we are working with our partners on something called the Analytics Anywhere. Mm. And it has uh, three main attributes uh, uh, that we have built together. And, and basically the whole major premise is that data has gravity. So if, if, if petabytes of, or terabytes of data are getting generated at the edge, you cannot move that data to some central location to do the processing. So you have to now, the world is changing. Instead of moving data to compute, you have to move compute to where the data resides. Mm. And, and so what we are leveraging is something called as federated AI. So that keep, remember that word federated AI. So what federated AI lets you do is let basically move compute to where the data is residing, process that data, and let's just move model insights to a central location and aggregate that. So it gives you, privacy benefits because you're not shipping your raw data out of your four walls, as well as cost production. You're not backhauling all that data to a central location. So that's the first major attribute of this analytics anywhere. Second uh, key uh, attribute is the marketplace that I already mentioned. So this actually is a marketplace. Think of it where providers of data, providers of algorithms, and even providers of AI pipelines like Kubeflow, et cetera, you can register those and then buyers can come and actually get smart contracts and then actually say, okay, I'm gonna use this data for so many days and then actually run their algorithms, create the model, and then they can take the model out of this secure marketplace sandbox, which is secure Kubernetes cluster, and they can use it in their production environments. So, so the whole idea of marketplace is the second key part of the solution of analytics anywhere. And the third one is basically uh, what everybody has already mentioned, no code and low code, because end of the day, um, you know, we believe that you, know, you have to democratize AI, otherwise subject matter experts, it's taking them too long. And, and so all of this is now hosted at a location like Equinix, which is well interconnected to the different data sources, public clouds, private data centers, the edge. So this is the new solution that we have brought. It's called Analytics Anywhere, and we are experimenting with many agencies. Yeah. Fantastic. Sounds awesome. Well, we're going to take another short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. <laughs> 